All right. Uh, good uh, morning, everybody. Um, we're about to start the uh, presentation. My name is uh, Matt Pretorius. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. It's quite a, a cold winter's morning here on the high felt of South Africa. Um, but before I start the uh, start the presentation uh, this morning, I'll, I'll, I will be talking to you about flamingos. But before I begin, just a few um, house rules. Um, so I would like to ask everybody to please take note of some of these rules as outlined on the screen. Um, I will only be answering questions after the formal presentation is over. And should you feel the need to ask something, you can do so by using the question and answer box um, in your uh, Zoom screen. You can find the Q&A box by hovering your mouse cursor at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And then I'll do my best to answer as many questions at the end of the presentation. All right, so uh, the, the title of my presentation today is called uh, Parading in Pink. Um, and it's a presentation about the movements of lesser flamingos, particularly adult lesser flamingos in Southern Africa. Um, my name is Matt Pretorius, and I am a senior field officer with the Wildlife and Energy Program of the Endangered Wildlife Trust. And the main focus of our program is to engage with power utilities to help them make their infrastructure safe for wildlife. And um, birds is one of our main sort of focus areas because the, we, we do get a lot of bird electrocutions and collisions happening on our power infrastructure. Um, all right, then moving on, um, I'll just quickly go over uh, the presentation outline and what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll start by introducing the different species of flamingo found across the globe, um, including the old and the new world species. I'll then talk specifically about the lesser flamingo, about its ecological requirements, as well as the various threats that are faced by this species. I'll then also describe previous evidence of flamingo movements, including observations of movement patterns and, and the predictions about the ecological and environmental aspects that may drive lesser flamingo movements. And that will take us um, nicely into our specific study uh, where I'll be highlighting the results from uh, our satellite tracking project. And I'll conclude by unpacking some of the implications of these data for lesser flamingo conservation and in particular how this may affect current power line mitigation efforts. Well, flamingos, why study flamingos? Flamingos are cool animals, aren't they? I, I don't think there are many people that hold much animosity, animosity for these uh, beautiful birds. They're not really persecuted by humans to the same extent um, as other species that are perceived to have a direct impact on people and their livelihoods. Um, but they certainly do make for interesting subjects to study. They sport anatomical features that are quintessentially ascribed to flamingos such as their long legs, the gangly long legs on which they often only use one as a stilt on which to perch. Um, and of course, uh, they've got these long sort of S-shaped necks um, and deeply curved bills that are also equipped with a filtration system akin to that of the, of the miniature version of what you get in the baleen whales. And of course, their pink plumage itself is, uh, is a very typical sort of flamingo characteristic. Although the, the adult plumages may vary considerably according to their diet, um, uh, giving me new meaning to the phrase, you are what you eat. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of variation in the size and the shape and the color of the different species of flamingo that you get across the globe. There's six species of flamingo, including the greater and the lesser flamingo, which occurs in the so-called um, old world, uh, which is Africa, Europe, and Asia, um, uh, sort of that distribution there. And then, um, and then you get four species in the new world in the, in the Americas, and most of them are contained in South America. Um, the lesser flamingo itself is mostly contained within the African continent, although there is a population that also exists in uh, India. 
um, uh, the greater flamingo with which the lesser flamingo often co-occurs um, is by far the most widespread and, and metropolitan species. While the, the James's and Andean flamingos have comparatively, comparatively very small distribution ranges. Looking at the, uh, the South American species, um, these, these flamingos are beautiful and they occur in some of the most beautiful environments on the planet including really high altitude lakes uh, created by you know volcanic processes in the great andes mountain range and um, some of these places are, are unique in that they can support up to three species in the same area which is a site that's really impossible anywhere else on earth because you only get the two species in africa um, and as with the soda lakes in africa the harsh water chemistry of these lakes are virtually monopolized by the flamingos as they are the only species that are really capable of extracting nourishment from these uh, these caustic waters. Uh, one one of these South American species, the Andean flamingo, is currently the most threatened uh, uh, flamingo, according to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Red List categories, um, and uh, where they are listed as as being vulnerable. The James's, the James's flamingo and the Chilean flamingo are listed as near threatened, which is also the same status that is currently given to the lesser flamingo. Just looking quickly at their, um, their global distribution ranges, the uh, James's or the Puna flamingo is another name for it. Um, um, you can see looking at, at this species as well as the Andean flamingo that they have pretty small distribution ranges and both of them are confined to the countries of Peru, Bolivia, Chile and Argentina, those really high altitude um, lakes in the Andes. Um, remarkably, they occupy lakes at altitudes in excess of 4,700 meters in elevation. Um, the, uh, the Chilean flamingo is, is far more widespread, occurring as far north as, um, as Ecuador in South America. Then you also get uh, uh, another species, the American flamingo, which is mostly confined to the tropical waters of the Caribbean. You know, the Bahamas, really lovely, lovely places, lovely island lifestyle. Um, and here they forage in, in coastal waters including some of the most idyllic locations for humans. And they certainly seem to enjoy it um, in the surf in, in these areas. Beautiful flamingos. Now, coming back to the sort of so-called old world flamingos, which includes the, uh, the greater and the lesser flamingo, um, both of which occur in Southern Africa and um, uh, Southern Africa is, of course, the main area of, of our particular sort of focus. Um, the greater flamingo is currently uh, listed as least concern, and its global population trend is apparently increasing. So that's good news. Um, and as with the, the lesser flamingo, they are dispersive, although unlike the lessers, they are also known to migrate in certain areas. Um, and this is particularly the case with the uh, sort of paleoarctic population of greater flamingos um, uh, from which we know that there are regular sort of migratory movement patterns. Um, then you have the sort of population in the Mediterranean and, and, and West Africa and they appear to sort of be linked and some people consider them a, a meta population of sorts. And then you have the, the sub-Saharan um, greater flamingos, which breed quite intermittently and opportunistically and occur in mixed flocks with, uh, with the lesser flamingos. And now coming, of course, to the, the star of the show, the lesser flamingo. Um, this is the most numerous of the world's flamingos. Um, current estimates place the, the global population at between 2.2 and 3.2 million individuals. But now this is quite a large range in, in, in that estimate. Um, and, you know, it, it equates to uh, uncertainty of about a million birds, 
which really just highlights the fact that these birds are very difficult to count. And such is the nature of their movements and the apparent opportunistic breeding. Um, but the bulk of the population, about 1.5 to 2 million birds, is contained in East Africa, where they congregate in large numbers on the soda ash lakes of the Rift Valley. The Asian population contains some 600,000 or so individuals, while only around 70,000 birds occur in the Southern African population um, and is, of course, comparatively quite small. And then you also have this small um, population in West Africa, which is, contains about 20,000 individuals. There's relatively strong evidence that at least some of these populations are, in fact, connected. Um, if you look at their distribution uh, range map, you can see that some of the populations have, for example, been in the past uh, supplemented by huge influxes of birds, which outnumber the known local populations, obviously meaning that these birds must have come from, from somewhere else. And a very recent example of this was reported from India. Uh, while India was in lockdown at, in the beginning of May, um, lesser, a whole bunch of lesser flamingos infiltrated the, the city or the outskirts of the city of Mumbai um, in record numbers. Uh, some reports estimate over 150,000 individuals have descended on the water bodies within this uh, sort of urban area. This is not really an unusual occurrence in that these migrations are known to occur between uh, November and May in India, but never before had they descended in such numbers. There's of course some speculation about the origin of these birds, and it is certainly plausible that at least some may have um, come from, from the African continent. Um, so this kind of takes us nicely into bird movements and bird movement strategies and um, Incidentally, this photograph depicts a typical scene when it comes to flamingo movements as nocturnal flights are known for both the greater and the lesser flamingos. But, um, but how far do they fly? Where exactly do they go? And why fly at night? And why undertake these long range movements in the first place? Well, let's look at the different movement strategies and then look at the reasons why they might um, employ these strategies. So bird movements can generally be classified as migration, nomadism, dispersal, and local home range restricted, uh, restricted movements. Dispersal is essentially when an animal moves from one place to another, remaining at its destination, while migration then includes a mirror image of that movement. Um, with the animal more or less returning to its place of origin. Home range restricted movements are typical of what we often refer to as sort of central place forages, where the distribution of an animal's movements is more or less, or less uh, centered around a focal area, be it a defended territory or a nesting site. Um, nomadism, on the other hand, is often thought of being a more random type of sort of movement pattern. However, perhaps a better description would be to call it a reactive movement of sorts, um, a reactive movement that appears erratic due to the nature of the environment in which an animal lives and the habitat on which it depends. So a typical nomadic species thus often inhabit environments that are highly unpredictable in terms of resource availability and resource quantity and quality for that matter. So this obvious or, or often includes um, species such as uh, birds in, in very arid regions um, and uh, birds in arid re regions exemplify the traits of nomads, especially waterfowl. The species in this photograph is an arctic tern and um, it has perhaps one of the most well-known examples of, uh, of uh, migratory movement. Um, mig migratory birds such as the arctic tern are often in the news because they're record breakers. Um, 
the Arctic tern is thought to make the longest mig migration of any animal in the world. And it essentially flies between the Arctic and the Antarctic regions of the world from Greenland to Antarctica and back. And long-lived individuals may rack up some 1.5 million miles in its lifetime. But there's also some land birds that also regularly migrate. Cuckoos are, are good local examples of this. Um, because we're usually very aware of their seasonal arrival in Southern Africa. There's a very recent study um, in the news by the Mongolia Cuckoo Project that revealed a 7,500 mile trip from Zambia to Mongolia by one of its uh, satellite tagged individuals. And birds such as cuckoos mainly migrate to overwinter in warmer climates, thus they typically present a sort of a summer range and then a winter range um, connected by long directional flights. But flamingos, flamingos are usually thought of as nomadic birds, um, although some migratory patterns have been um, described for certain populations, as is the case with um, the earlier example of the greater flamingos. Uh, research papers such as this one by Zakara et al. have provided genetic evidence for irregular and small gene flow between seemingly isolated populations and link these movements between um, the southern and east African populations. The apparent rarity of such movements speaks to the opportunistic and reactive movements of lesser flamingos. Uh, which are of course characteristics of nomadic uh, species. But what then, what about um, the sort of within population movements? Do lesser flamingos also move nomadically between water bodies within their local distribution in response to environmental fluctuations such as rainfall? Um, satellite tracking data from other waterfowl from things such as ducks and geese suggest that nomadism is a common movement strategy among Afrotropical water birds. So there we have the, uh, the lesser flamingos inland um, distribution in South Africa. You can see that they mostly utilize the wetter eastern parts in Southern Africa, and generally avoiding the arid west areas um, of the subregion, such as the, the Kalahari. However, they do also occur in some of the most arid areas on the west coast. Um, these are some of the driest regions in, in Africa. But um, unfortunately, there, there are only sort of four current breeding locations for the species. And three of these are, are contained within um, in southern Africa. Um, of course, that's four breeding locations in, in Africa. They also breed in, um, in India. But um, these include Suwa Pan in Botswana, uh, in the Mahari Hari Pans complex, uh, Etosha Pan in Namibia, and Kampus Dam in, uh, in Southern Africa. So that's, uh, that's Etosha and that's Kampus Dam. Um, and then the fourth and the largest breeding site is Lake Natron. And uh, this is a, a sort of a mineral rich soda ash lake in Northern Tanzania. And you can see looking at this map that um, the lesser flamingos suffers from a serious case of having too many, uh, all your eggs in, in too few baskets. And of course, should one of these key, key breeding sites be compromised, it would surely have a ca sort of cat catastrophic consequences for the global population. So we need to know how these populations are linked and, and what threats they encounter along the way. We, um, we set out with our own project to investigate the movement um, ecology of lesser flamingos uh, with a particular aim of determining how they move in relation to overhead power lines. And um, we captured uh, lesser flamingos at uh, two pans, one in, in the Northwest province and, and uh, another in the Free State. And this uh, picture here shows a sample of the birds present at the Free State site, um, huge numbers of birds. Um, we completed the captures in, in the beginning of uh, 2016. 
and um, the trapping and the tagging of lesser flamingos followed established methods by previous researchers. We ended up with a sample of 12 uh, flamingos, six from the Northwest and six from the Free State. Um, incidentally, there were also six males and six females. Um, and we fitted them with GPS GSM satellite tracking devices, uh, which we fitted by means of a Teflon backpack uh, harness. And the devices are, are solar powered and um, they have tiny solar panels that are situated on a raised platform that prevents them from being covered by, by feathers. Um, so yeah, that was the, the, the trapping efforts. You can see that the tracking devices sit really nicely on the flamingos. And after four years, this is, um, this is essentially a summary of, of the movements. Don't worry too much about the numbers here, but um, essentially that um, number four represents the Maharihari or Sua Pan in the Maharihari Pan complex. And number three is Comfort Dam. Um, close to the southern uh, end of their, their movements. Uh, number five is Itosha in Namibia. And then we, as you can see, we had a bird that moved all the way east across the, uh, the Indian Ocean to Madagascar, which was, which was um, quite exciting. Um, we were quite surprised at this particular movement as it was the first time that a lesser flamingo was tracked between Madagascar and mainland Africa. Um, these are just some zoomed in movements of the flamingo movements at, at each one of the, the main sort of water bodies that they visited. Um, they spent an average of 68% of, of all of their track days at only two places, Comfort Dam and Suapan in, in um, Botswana. And uh, flamingo number two, the Madagascar bird, is the only individual that moved to the coast. This is just a, a, a short video showing the, uh, the movements. You'll see that each um, bird uh, is represented by a different color. And there you can see the birds all move up to the Kharikhari at the same time and then move back to, to Comfort Dam at the same time as well. Meanwhile, the Madagascar bird moved between Madagascar and Mozambique. So you'll see there's very, very regular movements in between um, Comfort Dam and, uh, and Suapan via Barbushpan in the Northwest Province. And just that's just a quick summary of their movements there. Um, so uh, looking at their annual trajectories, um, uh, an analysis revealed that most of their annual movements can be classified, in fact, as migratory movements, while home range and nomadic movement patterns describe less than 10% of their annual trajectories, which was an interesting result, given that they're thought to be mainly nomadic. Um, one of the birds was found uh, under a power line um, where it had collided with a power line. And, and this kind of brings me to our initial objective um, of trying to determine, um, looking at their movements in relation to power lines and where best to mark these power lines. And um, we sort of noticed that because the birds fly at night, uh, traditional mitigation methods such as uh, flappers and, and the different markers that come in different sizes and shapes that are placed on power lines may be ineffective because of their nocturnal um, activity. A, um, a local uh, company then developed a, a sort of new device that uses um, LED lights that flicker at night obviously making the, the lines more visible to nocturnal flying birds. And these are also powered by, by solar panels and they kind of resemble um, the cat eyes that you see on, on our roads. But how do you decide where to, where to mark these? They're quite expensive devices. And of course, the, the act of marking itself is, is an expensive exercise because, um, because you often have to use a chopper for the bigger lines um, and, and uh, you often have to use specialized live line teams, people with uh, special live line training, which costs, uh, costs a lot of money. Um, and if, 
Of course, first we looked at this sort of movement corridor as, a, as an obvious choice for narrowing down um, important uh, areas in which to, to mark power lines. But then looking at the actual flight heights of the flamingos, we saw that um, they fly at heights uh, far above the tallest transmission line towers for the majority of the length of these sort of regular migratory movements. As seen by this graph over here, they, you know, they fly, you know, over 500 meters above the ground sometimes. And the, um, what we found is that the only, um, the only area or the only place that they're really flying at a height where they would be at risk of collision with power lines is when they're very close to their departure and destination um, points or water bodies. So then, of course, it becomes really important to map the most suitable water bodies as a priority when considering power line collision mitigation. And to do this, we constructed habitat suitability models from information pertaining to food availability uh, from the known distribution of lesser flamingos. And then we went out and we ground truth these models to, you know, using the sort of presence and absence of flamingos at water bodies predicted to be suitable for them um, as a, a sort of gauge of whether the model was, was accurate or not. And it, it proved to be really accurate and we were able to accurately predict where flamingos um, occurred. And as a result, we can now kind of provide recommendations to ESCOM and other utilities about where best to install these, these markers. And it's just, I think, a really good example of, of how a conservation um, and and industry can work together to to make these uh, structures safe for for birds and wildlife. I've got several people to thank. Um, I'll keep the names there up on the on the screen. Um, uh, in particular, I'd like to to thank ESCOM uh, for for funding the project. Um, Andre Buerta, uh, Rebotile, and uh, Renal Fasaghi helped to capture birds. Then I'd like to also thank Nedek uh, and Sambi from Northwest Parks, as well as Brian uh, Collan from the Free State uh, Conservation Department. Um, and that, that kind of brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope I didn't rush through it too much. Uh, there's quite a lot uh, that I needed to cover, cover but um, I'll now be uh, answering uh, some questions and answers. Before I do, um, if there's something that, that we don't get to, then obviously um, we can, uh, you can contact me via email. Um, my email address is on the screen there. And then also, if you ever um, come across or you know of somebody that comes across um, a, a, a bird or a wildlife mortality or injury related to power lines or power infrastructure, you can report these. Um, to that other email address, web at ewt.org.za. So um, I suppose I'll be start looking at the uh, the questions. Um, so we've got a question here from Roxanne. Um, Roxanne asks, why would Flamingo number two move to Madagascar? Well, that's, that's quite an interesting question. And, you know, um, unfortunately, uh, it was only that one bird that made that trip. So, you know, a sample size of, of one is very little to go on uh, with regard to, to kind of making predictions about the environmental drivers that, that regulate the movements of, of flamingos, particularly something um, as, as drastic as, as that particular movement. Um, what I can say is looking at the satellite imagery um, of where the flamingo ended up, um, it ended up at a place called Mahajanga. Mahajanga is a town in the north of Madagascar. And um, I myself actually visited Madagascar in 2018. Um, uh, there's a beautiful island there called Nozi Bay. And um, uh, looking at the waters there, really rich um, coastal waters. Um, and the uh, the es big estuary at Mahajanga, I think, is 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 really good for flamingos in terms of the nutrients that it contains. Um, I can only guess that a lot of these flamingo uh, movements 
are also regulated by by learned it's really learned behavior from from conspecifics you know um, individuals of the same species that uh, that, that teach one another, one another essentially where these migratory routes are. And I presume that this particular individual had either come from Madagascar or has, has been flying in a group of, of other flamingos that, that know the route. What is quite interesting about that bird is that she, and it was a female, um, survived through some of the worst uh, cyclones that we've had on the sort of east coast of Africa. Um, you'll remember, remember some of these and, and the one in particular I think it was uh, last year in 2018, beginning of 2018, um, con uh, basically resulted in huge, huge damage and particularly in Mozambique so that was quite interesting. Um, so then there was another problem here uh, at this, uh, so Jane asks, uh, there seem to be large numbers of flamingos at the salt pans in Swakopmund in Namibia. Are these greater flamingos and do they ever breed there? So um, they, as far as I know, and I've been to Walfels Bay, which is not too far away, also the, uh, the salt pans there, and um, I know that the they are greater flamingos and they do sort of co-occur with um, with the lesser flamingos there and um, they do occur in huge numbers um, but um, uh, I know that um, Mike and Ann Scott which um, which uh, also were with the NAM power the, the sort of energy utility in, in Namibia um, I know that they uh, place some tracking devices on the greater flamingos there and, and there's some interesting local movements in that sort of um, coastal area. But um, I think most of the birds uh, there, they, I mean, the flamingos range so widely, they could really um, originate from any of the of the breeding sites. But um, the closest one to that would be Etosha. Um, Etosha, of course, is another breeding site for lesser and greater flamingos. Okay. Um, then there's another one here. We have often seen juvenile flamingos on the Berg River near Feldriff. And there's a question by Janine. Um, she says, I assume they don't breed there and where would they have come from? Um, and they still have all gray plumage. That's interesting, Janine. Yes, um, I have seen the flamingos at Feldriff and uh, the last time I visited Feldriff was quite a few years ago. And um, uh, at that particular time, I observed lesser flamingos, uh, both adults and juveniles, and um, the the young birds, the juvenile birds, have uh, sort of all grey plumage um, when they're already able to fly. And I know that some of the recent tracking work that's been done by the Salt Lake University um, from uh, from birds that were captive. Um, reared and released at Kampur Dam. Um, so that some of those juvenile birds, or at least I know of the one that has that has moved to the to the west coast. So they could have originated from Kampur Dam, they could have originated from the inland population. It's interesting that our adult birds that we uh, captured and tagged didn't really move to the coast, um, except for the uh, Madagascar flamingo. Okay, so then there's another question question by uh, Leticia, and she asks, how is the Campus Dam population doing against uh, the recent reports of uh, serious uh, sewer contamination of the water inflow? So I've had uh, uh, recent reports of, um, of the birds doing really well there. In fact, they've uh, recently successfully bred at Campus Dam both on the, um, uh, as far as I believe, both on the artificial island that was constructed specifically for them at Comfort Dam, as well as um, in the, at the fringes. So, um, so they, they're doing well, um, despite uh, all, the, all the drama um, previously. 
And then, so then Tanya, Tanya asks, have you provisionally looked at the extent of power lines and heating mitigation? And if so, how many kilometers were identified as high risk needing uh, mitigation? Um, Tanya, no, I don't unfortunately have a specific um, uh, statistic as to the, the length or the number of kilometers, the length of lines that, that need sort of urgent mitigation. Um, however, I can tell you that the, the, the water bodies that were identified as being really suitable for them, as well as um, that have potentially a, a dangerous power infrastructure uh, within that three kilometer buffer, only included about um, in the region of 20, 20 different water bodies. And um, that, that three kilometer um, uh, buffer means that at most um, you'll have, you know, the sort of 60 kilometer power lines that need really urgent um, mitigation. But a, a lot of these areas are already marked. It's just, are they marked with the, with the correct devices? You know, um, perhaps some of these older incidents need to be revisited and uh, for us to gauge whether the flamingos are um, colliding with, with these li uh, lines already marked with conventional devices. We know from some of the sites that they are doing that. Um, let's have a look at some of these other questions. So Louise asks, um, do you have any information about the movement of lesser flamingos between the Orange River mouth and other water bodies? Um, Louise, no, I don't, but I would advise you to kind of watch the news. Um, you know, there's also a Save the Flamingo Facebook page where there's a lot of uh, information that gets posted regularly from different tracking projects as well. Um, so you can definitely have a look there. I'll, I'll certainly keep my, my ears um, primed and, and, and uh, look out for, for new information. Um, what's interesting about the Orange River mouth is I believe that it, it, it closed up with the drought um, uh, a year or so ago, or however many months ago. And it would be really interesting to see how that has affected the flamingos um, there at Alexander Bay and around you went that area. Uh, do, okay, Jane asked, do greater and lesser flamingos ever interbreed? Jane, I don't believe that they do. Um, the, the, they're such different birds. I mean, the size difference between these two is actually quite comical when you see the two standing next to one another. It's like David and Goliath, literally. So just that sort of massive anatomical difference between the two species, I think would prevent them from interbreeding. Um, I, I stand to be corrected though, um, but as far as I know, there, there haven't been any records of them interbreeding. Uh, Eleanor asks, did flamingo number two join other flamingos in Madagascar. Um, I presume that she did. Unfortunately, you know, I wish we could put little tiny little cameras on, on all of these birds. And I know that people are doing it for, for really short flights for, for birds, but we're not quite there yet where we have this sort of first person view, like what's possible with drones these days in, in terms of, you know, having a look to see if the, if the birds are moving in groups. From my sort of observations of birds departing and arriving at water bodies um, is that they, they generally move in, in groups of like eight to ten birds. And what's interesting is it's kind of reflected in, in our power line collision mortality data um, as well. When when a fl flamingo collision mortality is recorded, usually it's more than one individual. You know, it's usually five or six birds in one incident. And this tells me that, you know, 
it's a kind of a follow the leader situation. You know, you'll see these birds flying in V formation. And um, I'm sure that flamingo number two made the journey across the uh, Mozambican channel with some other flamingos. Um, all right. And then Jane asks, how long do they spend at um, at a site where they don't breed? So what is the sort of length of the non-breeding season? And then, and then she asks, what is the main breeding season? Well, you know, they are kind of opportunistic um, breeders really, but from what we've seen, you know, they, they kind of breed early summer, um, and uh, the the flamingos that have moved up to Mahari Khadi have done so in early summer and I presume to breed there um, in sort of March or so. Um, okay, so Gareth asks, um, uh, I'm always fascinated and intrigued by how flamingos tend to pick very polluted pans to forage and roost. Is this because of more food available in eutrophied water bodies? And, um, and then lastly, have you looked at how, at any predictions of how climate change will impact the distribution and movements of flamingos? That's a very interesting question. Um, your first question about the polluted pans, well, the, the two particular um, water bodies that were our, our trapping sites were um, left quite a lot to be desired in terms of the water hygiene, I must say. It, it's staying to high heaven. And I, you know, I'm pretty sure that there must have been raw sewage that was bumped into those pans at some point. But yeah, it does lead to, as you say, eutrophication, which essentially is a a a, a um a overstimulation or a, a um uh, over rich environment which me, which leads to these algal blooms and of course it's a, it's a, it's this algae and this sort of um, cyanobacteria that the flamingos feed on and they, they filter feed the algae um, and that's why you often get them in in sewage farms you know um, very stinky uh, stinky birds but um, certainly um, well suited to make use of that food source. And yes, of course, the, the climate change impacts uh, will be very interesting, especially if we look at um, uh, the increased aridity uh, that's predicted for the, particularly for our western parts of southern Africa. You know, I think, I think water birds in particular would, are likely to shift more from a migratory movement pattern to these sort of nomadic movements. Um, um, we know from there's some, some uh, well, there's quite a bit of information from waterfowl. Um, one was a, a PhD by um, Dominic Hendry, who also works for the EWT, looked at the, the movements of Afrotropical uh, waterfowl. And then there's, um, there's some information from from the outback, from the Australian outback, and waterfowl, of course, you know that's extreme desert environment, and um, and and some of those ducks that were tracked there were found to be highly nomadic in their movements. So I presume that as um, as things get warmer and drier, then that's going to be you know kind of the norm for these birds. Okay, uh, Eleanor asks, has the situation improved at Copper's Dam in terms of the sewage? Has there been a cleanup? Um, I haven't been keeping too well up to date uh, with the Comfort Dam situation, but as I reported earlier, you know, um, the birds did breed there successfully, so I presume that, that things have improved. Um, Jane Turner asks, is there any way of encouraging the flaming flamingos to establish new breeding colonies as they're doing with penguins? Um, what makes a site particularly suitable for the birds? So Jane um, ref is referring here to some of the, some of the efforts that um, have been made to try and encourage uh, African penguins back to some of their previous um, 
previous areas that they were known to occupy. For example, um, I know that they've been trying to set the Whip Nature Reserve um, uh, on the West Coast. So, um, so basically they're putting, I, I can't remember what the material was, but like ceramic um, uh, models of, of penguins on the shore to make birds uh, from the sea, um, you know, notice this and, and make it look like there's a whole bunch of penguins on the shore and encourage them to come ashore and start establishing it. With the flamingos, you know, there's, there's actually a really, really well um, documented example, of course, from Comfort Dam where um, where they established a um, an artificial island to stimulate the birds to to breed there and um, and that's what happened and they've been using it successfully i think i'll take one last question and then um, um and then we'll uh, I'll, I'll i'll try and um, if you have any other questions, you can email me as well. Okay, so Iris asks, why are they persecuted by humans? Um, I don't think there's too much of a direct persecution or animosity towards these birds. That's not, it's not like a vulture, you know, there aren't too many superstitions surrounding flamingos as far as I know, but there is of course a a disturbance factor and I think that is the the main issue that we're sitting with with these these uh, four breeding sites in Africa is is the disturbance issue and that's why you know we need to make sure that that these sites are protected we need to make sure that um, you know the birds aren't aren't harmed by our, our presence there um, you know it's not just humans it's feral animals feral dogs and cats um, and 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 that's that's the issue so i mean i think the the best for us humans is just to leave them be and they're a beautiful site and uh, i hope it's a site that our, our children our children's children will still be able to enjoy one day all right i think that um we'll conclude things there and um as i've mentioned please feel free to to contact me on that email address uh, should you have any any further questions